Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep, it's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show, where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. These are the things that drive us. And this is a first for us. You know, usually I have my co-host, co-producer, Jim McCarthy. He's a drum hobbyist. He's a pro voiceover artist. He'll chime in. He's the yin to my yang, but he's producing another podcast right now. So I'm lucky. I got this man all to myself, and it's long overdue. And it's a first because there's it's our first classical percussionist on the Rich Redman Show. He is a longtime percussionist with the Boston Symphony and the Boston Pops for over 40 years and also founder of Grover Pro Percussion, a manufacturer of world-class percussion instruments. Of course, I'm talking about my friend, Neil Grover. What's up, bud? Hey, Rich. How are you? Oh, man, it's good to see you. Is that your home office? Is that your teaching yeah, facility? Yeah, no, I'm down in my, uh, my basement uh, home office, and I have a huge uh, studio here with all kinds of stuff that you hit. You know, I have timpani. I have marimbas vibes. I, 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 I have... You know, I have 14 slide whistles. I mean, I, I, I've gone nuts. I have so much stuff. I don't know. I think my wife's going to bury me with it. Just so this is the lower door. the lower portion of your house. You have every major the whole thing. in the percussion family. Right. And I had it built so I can get timpani in and out of the doors of 38 inches uh, wide so, so I can get timps in and out. But I, I used to have everything in a, in a factory space when I was really playing all the time. I had stuff at Symphony Hall. I had stuff in a warehouse. You know, we used to use some cartridge companies here in Boston. They had a lot of my stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I still, I, it's hard to get rid of stuff. I have symbols that people have given me over the years. Armin Zildjian gave mm -hmm. me a bunch of things. And 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 the snare drum that Bobby Grazzo, who started Fives, gave me. I mean, it, I'm emotionally attached to this stuff. To a lot of the instruments. And then there's probably uh, stories behind each instrument. Like, well, oh, that's the snare drum I use with Bernstein. Or that's the, you know right, what I mean? Right, right. There's stories. My old teacher, when I was a kid, I studied with a very old percussionist in New York who uh, played in the NBC Symphony with Toscanini when it was around. And then wow. Radio City with Billy Gladstone. So he gave me stuff that Gladstone gave him. And, you know, it's some of it I'm going to give to like the PAS Museum. And oh, that's smart. I, I want people to have access to some of the stuff. But well, yeah, it's re it's funny when I think about, you know, how I'm now a man. I was the youngest man in the room forever in every band. And now I'm a man of a certain age. You go to the PAS Museum and they had a exhibit on drum machines. And so it's like, oh my God, there's the SR-16, the SR-18, the HR-16. Yes. I, I, I went through all those and then the samplers that you would go through and then now it's everything that is that powerful is an app on your phone. It's crazy. Right, right. right. Well, I'll tell you something really funny. I, I Amongst other things I do now that I've left uh, playing professionally, really, um, I do some contracting in town, big orchestra stuff. So I got a call from a producer says we 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 need a big orchestra for Zelda in concert. Zelda and Kai said, "Great, the video game, right?" Well, don't get ahead of me. So, <laughs> Zelda, okay, great. I hire the orchestra and I figure I'm going to play in the percussion section. I show up at the rehearsal and they're handing out click track, click in, in your monitor. I said, "What the hell is this for?" They said, "For Zelda." I said, "Well, where is she?" They said, no, don't you know who Zelda is? I said, I think she's a singer, right? They said, no, it's a video game. I blew it. Sorry, man. And, and the cats are laughing at me. I said, look, the, the only video game I ever played was Pong. So on my day, I'm dating myself, you know. Is that how far you got, Pong? You never got to Pac-Man? No, not really. I was I, I was living in a practice room when that came yeah, out. Yeah, you did. Well, that's how you, you know, I like when someone says 10,000 hours is a good start. Yeah. So when right. I think about someone like you, that that's the daunting part of being a percussionist. You know, I just, I have my master's degree, so I'm an overeducated rock drummer and I had to do all the right things. I had to learn my jazz standards in the 12 keys and I had to learn my Kaiko Abi for mallet technique and try to get a decent sound on the timpani and your finger rolls and warming up the bass drum and choosing the right Glock mallets and getting the right suspended cymbal mallets for the Percy Granger, like all the stuff. But mm -hmm. it was always so daunting looking at a room full of percussionists and going, how am I going to divide up my time today? Because I need to be good at all of these things, you know? That's the hard thing, keeping it all at your fingertips. It, it's impossible. You can't you can't be at your best game on everything. On every instrument, yeah. So, uh, um, you know, typically once you get a job, 
a lot of times the sections will specialize in areas and you know, yeah. one, I will play mo most of the snare drum, the other bass drum, cymbals, mallets. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way it's done here in Boston. That's kind of an old school way of doing things. But when I was in school, you know, starting with Vic Firth, yeah. you know, he only took, uh, he only took four people each year. And there were everybody else got teaching assistants, there right? Or yeah, there weren't enough practice rooms and, you know, I'd, I'd get my ass out of bed at 5 a.m. to get a couple hours in before my first class to make sure I can get into a practice room. That's amazing. So you're up at 5, you get two hours in before your 8 o'clock music theory class. Right, right. Get a couple of more in the afternoon and an hour or two at night. If I can get six hours in, that was kind of my goal. So Boston was, is, is your, are you born, bred Boston? No, I'm, I'm from New York. I was okay. from Long Island. In Long fact, Island, I yeah. Dom Famulero and I studied with the same teacher. I knew Dom since I was a kid. Yeah. He was a couple of years older than me and always better than me because he, a few years when, when one guy's 16, the other's 13 is a big difference. Uh, sure. But Dom, a lot of Dom's, um, you know, and we lost Dom recently. Tragically. God rest his soul. What a great man. Uh, oh, but, but a lot of his motivational work came from our teacher who was a motivator. It, it, I didn't realize till much, much later that I wasn't just taking drum lessons. I was learning about life. You were, you're taking life lessons. And it was great. And uh, yes, yeah, so I'm originally from Long Island. Uh, I came up here to study with, with Vic Firth at, at New England Conservatory. I, I got into Juilliard. I could have studied with Goodman, but my parents told me I'd have to live at home. And I was not going to live at home. You wanted the college experience. Uh, I was going to college partially to learn music and partially meet a lot of girls. So if I was living at home, it would have, you know, would have put a little cold water. Oh, it's cool that you had girl fever too. And you were, you could squeeze it in between night and bald mountain and well, listen, uh, you know, th th listen, I was, I was, I was usually standing right in front of the Sopranos and I ended up marrying a Soprano. So there you go. You know? Is that what happened for me? I dated, I dated two flautists, a clarinet player and three French horn players. Cause okay. the French horns were always kind of by the percussion section. Right. right Weren't they? Right. They have good lips, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I tried one time dating a nurse, but it never worked because I wanted to go out on Monday night. She wanted to go Friday and Saturday night. I was always playing concerts. I can't, you know. Yeah. So, so, you know. Musician you Saturday is Mondays. Right, right. I said, we'll go on a dark day. She goes, what's that? I said, Monday. Yeah, yeah. She didn't want to go out Monday night because she had to work Tuesday, you know. That's crazy. Um, anyway, well, I'm from New York, came to Boston, never intended to stay here. I was going to go back to New York um, to, you know, work maybe on Broadway or, or, you know, freelance stuff. And I just started working while I was at conservatory. I started getting calls for stuff. I joined the union while I was in school and, you know, I was played chorus line when it was on a national tour. I was still in school. Uh, there was a lot of work on a, on a, on a, on a, on a Saturday night. I could always pick up a wedding, you know, from the union hall. Yeah. You know, so you were playing drum set too. I was originally a drum set player. Okay, I didn't start a percussion timpani mouse till I was sixteen, um, and I had a lot of catching up to do, especially on mallets to re reading. You know, sure, but, oh god, me too. Uh, but I was at school. Yeah, I, I played a little. I'm not the you know. I there were much better drum set players than me. Akira Tana was in with ah, me. Ah, yeah. Uh, Matt Gordy. Uh, um, there was a. Uh, um, Anton Fig, although Anton was, you know, I didn't, we didn't cross paths very much. He was, I think, in the jazz or third stream department. But, you know, I used to say, look, I could play pretty much anything. I'm not the best at anything. But if you need a job done, I'm like a general contractor. Call yes. me. I'll get the job. Done. No, that's the thing is that you're just an overall fantastic musician. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I've seen a million of your clinics where you dive into like, you know, the uh, I think the last one I saw at PAS was one on the the toys, you know, so the thumb yeah, rolls yeah. and yeah, uh, yeah. your the fist knee technique, that you get right, 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 the nets and everything. Right, and the right. thing is, is that the thing is, is that not only are you a great musician, and you're a human and you let your humanity show and you you don't take yourself too seriously, well, which is enjoy what you're doing and, and take it lightly. You know, it's not brain surgery. Yeah. But a lot of a lot of classically trained, scholastic, I know, I know. academic percussionists are boring, and you right. are not. You right. Are well, not. they're 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 almost like um, they're percussion fundamentalists. They're so tied into the yank they can't. I'm a, originally being a drummer. My dad was a jazz musician. 
I played some big band stuff. Yes. I'm used to listening. <clears throat> so I, I was thinking about what I'm getting is just a guy pretty much where to put the notes, what notes, maybe. But you know, you, you have to interpret it and you have to um you have to make music. Yeah. <clears throat> but to some of these people, it's like a math equation. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's I, I see that I see that and maybe the horn, so horn players will explain it to me or they'll kill me, but you there's so many pop dates that happen and there's a rhythm section up there and they've got everything memorized but they'll you they'll be like a horn section up there like for like a live tv broadcast like with a really right. hip band and they've got to have their charts right right, so, right you know what i mean well the difference between i think jazz musicians and classical musicians classical musicians play with their eyes Yes. Yes, which is to play with their ears. That's profound. That's probably going to be the title of the episode. You know, you know, they, they, you know I mean, it, it's, you know, well, you get these literalists saying, well, it should be exactly the way Beethoven intended it. I said, wait a minute. Look around the orchestra. We're using violins, modern violins with steel strings, which they didn't use in Beethoven. You know, it sounds better today. Yes. It should sound better. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do things and, Starting with Vic Firth, Vic always was, uh, you know, approaching as a musician first, as a percussionist, a musician who happens to play percussion. There you go. All music, and he took some liberties that he thought were tasteful, and uh, it was just, it was so inspirational studying with him on many levels. Um, but it was, I, tough. it was tough, right? He was very tough, but fair. Yeah. I mean, but I saw, I saw guys come out of lessons crying i mean he he he, he pushed you and he, he said to me once he says you know neil talent got you this far um perseverance is what's going to carry you from here wow and he said, if you can't make it through me you're not going to make it professionally you're not going to be able to deal with it and he was right he yeah. was right you know so um it was um it was a great great education on many levels Man, well, Neil, I'm I'm thinking about here just uh, just to clarify things. Percussionist with the Boston Symphony and Boston Pops for over forty years. So since the last time I talked to you, you said you're playing less. Yeah. Well, what happened is COVID hit. Okay. Um, uh, and I was thinking I was when I turned sixty five, which I was about sixty four then. Yeah. Um, I can get my AFM pension. And it was pretty good. And I was I wanted to do that. Um, I started to have some arthritis and hand issues, small stuff. But I noticed stuff that I could play in my sleep. I was having some, you know, difficulty with it. Interesting. Yeah. And I said, you know, I'd rather leave two years too soon than two months too late. I don't want people saying he used to be a good player. It's the Seinfeld theory. Leave on top. Right. Well, well and the thing is. Fortunately, I'm in a position financially that I didn't have to keep working. Uh, so I was, I decided during COVID, I said, um, you know, I just made a decision. I was going to, uh, as Snagglepush used to say, exit stage right. You know, so old, you're teaching and you're contracting. Well, I'm doing some contracting. I'm not teaching at all. Um, to make a, a long story, not so long. I ended up contracting an orchestra for this show, Celtic Woman, a number of years. They oh were, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the one of the founders who plays the fiddle, who's an incredible Irish fiddler, Celtic fiddler, and dances while she plays. Ah, wow! Called me one day and said, "I'm living in New Hampshire. Would you manage me?" And I said, "No, I'm not a manager. I don't know." She said, look, can I buy you lunch? I said, no, you can't buy me lunch. I'll buy you lunch. And so we had lunch. And to make a long story short, I started working with her, kind of putting a new new show together and things like that. And, you know, I, I always wanted to do some composition and arranging and things like that. And I've been studying it on my own for a long time. So now I'm working with her. I do arrangements for her. I, oh. uh, I do some conducting. She opens for the Irish tenors. I conduct her part of the um, uh, show. What's real interesting, Rich, you know what? When you have a baton, if you make a mistake, it doesn't make any noise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. you, just got, 
Yeah, you know, it's so funny. The funny thing about a lot of maestros, you know, that if tell the listeners that don't know, that don't swim in the classical world, there's this thing called the ictus, which is basically right. the point of the baton hitting up some sort of imaginary point in the right. air. Right. And every conductor has their own. Some are more legato, some are right. more. Way. But right. did, you, did you see the Bradley Cooper maestro movie? On I have not seen it. I've been wanting to see my wife seen it twice. Um, I worked with Bernstein. This is imperative that you watch this because I think he did a great job. I embodying. heard he did an unbelievable job. So well, first I, of all, he had to learn how to conduct. Well, he's conducting Mahler in that. Yeah, no, he said he studied it for six years. You know, but I mean, I'm not a real conductor. I say I'm a semiconductor. You know, I get up there, I beat time, I know the tempi, and I can fix wrong notes if I hear something in the rehearsal. Yeah, uh, um, I'm consistent. So I'm kind of doing this whole new thing. Which is really exciting. I'm having a ball, you know, I'm having a, it's just, it's out of my comfort zone and it's, it's new. Hey, you know, what's so funny. I can relate because in my mid forties, second divorce, I'm thinking to myself, I want to honor this calling in my spirit and my heart in the back of my head. It's nagging. Get out from behind the drums and swim with the sharks and do something different that's still creative, that's completely out of your comfort zone. So I studied acting for six years and I got my SAG card. You know what I mean? It's like, do I make tons of money on it? Absolutely not. I spend more than I make. But there's just sometimes we have to do things that we're called to do. And you're a keynote speaker. I mean, you're you're doing a lot of stuff. I mean, it's, it's great. Well, you could do it because you have the gift of gab. Well, you know? I, I, I'm a frustrated stand-up comedian, but I I, I couldn't take the heckling, you know, you know. Well, um, you gotta you gotta figure out how to deal with the heckling in the room in that particular moment, and the only way to do that is to become a road comic and go do it. Uh, right. Well, you know, my my dad started his music career in the Catskill Mountains in New York, and the oh, book- it's in your blood. And he used to work in a hotel where Jerry Lewis was the comic, and, and my dad's somewhat of a comedian. Yeah. I mean, uh, he's 92, and he's still cuts me up. He, I talk to him every day. He tells me a joke every day. Sometimes he's smart. Joke. He's got his wits about him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. That's amazing. And, um, um, uh, and so it comes naturally. But, you know, yeah, you know, look, anybody who does anything long enough, whether it's playing an orchestra or you're playing in the same band, things, after a while, there's some stagnation that happens. You, you know, it, it's and people look for creative outlets outside of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who is who is that cat that I just used to love watching on PBS? Was it Fred Buddha? Freddie Buddha. Freddie was a dear friend and colleague of mine. Did he pass? Freddie, he's he passed away a few years ago. Oh. He was a great drummer. He was a terrific timpanist. He was timpanist at the ballet here. And then um, he played sing 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 like that. Uh, it, seemed like, oh. it seemed like the sing sing sting stuff. That kind of thing was like his wheelhouse man. oh yeah oh yeah well he went through the navy school of music like in the 40s or something but it's funny somebody asked him once what is it like playing drum set in an orchestra he said yeah man it's like trying to swing an elephant <laughs> <laughs> well because because i can imagine that the, the the disease is dragging and or just kind of square interpretation both of those things and you're in yeah. the back of the orchestra um, you know, so he once told me, you know, it's like it's like taking a giant cabin cruise out with a small motor. It's not going to turn very quickly. You know, <laughs> so he was a ham, too. Oh, yeah. No, no. He was he was terrific. He was hysterical and very nice man. And, uh, you know, he was uh, people would come to the concerts to see him play, see the drummer play. He was very real showman. That is amazing. Oh, I remember tuning in on PBS, like I said, and you were there. You were there in the back. Eventually, yeah. I, I mean, I used to watch it in high school. I used to watch Evening at Symphony and watch Vic and Evening at Pops with Fiedler. And, uh, you know, in those days, we didn't have 200 channels. And the Boston Symphony and Pops were on PBS, I think about 12 or 13 concerts a year. Yeah. And the big July 4 concert. And, oh, that's uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's all good. I have a lot of really good memories. Um, You know, I, um, I try and forget the stuff that was... That was frustrating and and remember the stuff that was fun yeah now what's interesting you mentioned um your union pension so uh, there's a there's to the listeners out there we have this musicians union so i'm a member of local 257 here 
in uh, in Nashville, and I know what my pension payment is going to be. You know, it's it, 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 if I have a car when I'm um, retired, it'll cover the car. It's not a lot, but yours is probably more robust because yeah. where is so for us in, in local 257, the pension is coming from a portion of each recording that makes it to the radio. It's not necessarily from performances because, you know, when I play with Jason Aldean, it's not a union gig. I'm just right, on a salary. Right, right, so I'm right. not getting paid for all these thousands of live performances I'm doing. But in your situation, there was the, your pen, a portion of each performance goes to your pension, a percentage right? Percentage of your weekly salary. Ah. So every week, a percentage goes into the, the pension fund. That is amazing. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is the trustees screwed it up in 2008. Yes. And lost a lot of money. And all of us that were getting close to retirement were being told, remember how much we told you 40 years ago you were going to get per month when you retire? Well, now it's half. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> sorry. And to make a long story short, yeah. through the miracle of um, a COVID um, funding, the government came in and put some money into uh, to make us all whole, not only musicians, but, you know, they did it for the car industry in Wall Street years ago. Why should that is, they be musicians? That's, that's great to hear, Neil, because I was worried about that, too, because I keep thinking to myself, OK, this is the amount that I'm probably going to get if I never make another penny and never play on another record that is heard on the radio. But uh, it might not be around when they I retire. It. No, no. The government put two point one billion dollars into it. You know, and so it's good. They said it's going to be solvent for 50 years. That's great. I'm not going to worry about it after 50 years. I mean, yeah, I'll be decomposing by that. <laughs> but um, thank you, but, uh, this, this is great. You're a semiconductor. <laughs> you're decomposing. Okay. I, should, I should have put a snare drum out with a cymbal. I could have do my own uh, rim shots. And oh, you know what? I should have one. There's one five feet away, Neil, right in here. I'm in my recording studio where I <laughs> do do my records for people. It's unbelievable. You can get a drum set, make a make a man cave sound good, put some microphones on the drums, and you could literally play drums on any song for any person in the world without ever it's meeting. Am it's amazing. The technology is amazing. It's uh, unbelievable. You know, I, I think of this. I have a friend who retired from teaching and he was telling me about during COVID, you know, the remote learning with the kids. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I said, well, imagine if it had happened 10 years earlier. Nobody had enough bandwidth in their homes to have video conferencing. Uh -huh. There'd be no learning. Yeah. So in a way, we're lucky it didn't. It happened when it did. Yeah. I mean, what are your what are your memories of COVID? Like I. I'm sitting here staring at a little green light on my Macintosh. And for two years, that's what I did. I taught at MI. I taught at Drummers Collective. I taught at the New School. I did private lessons. I just basically sat in front of this thing all day long. Right. What did, well, what, what did you do? For me, I wasn't worried so much. Although I, early on, I lost a number of colleagues and friends to COVID before uh, they had seen. I'm sorry. And no. I wasn't so much about getting COVID and being real sick. I was worried about my wife killing me, poisoning me, because we weren't used to being in the same house all yeah. day, every day. I think so, any couple uh, that could survive that, you know, I was dating my girl. Oh, yeah. and it's so what I did is I, I built out my home recording studio, nice. uh, got Logic Pro X, learned how to use it. Really? You know, I had a keyboard, waited keyboards here, started buying plugins and, and started started putting music together on my own. And I ended up my friend who's the Celtic fiddle player lives in New Hampshire. We ended up putting a whole album of music together and releasing an album and writing a show around the music that tours. I think you sent it to me. Yeah. Yeah. We're going back out in March to the West coast. That's great. So it was about two year project to get this um, whole thing done. And we had a lot of different uh, people adding stuff in Ireland, putting tracks down bagpipes. Okay. We, I don't play boron. I needed a boron, so I know a cat. And it, you know, in oh, court. I tried playing one for Pam Tills one time. We did like a some sort of a Celtic song, and I was like, yeah, these it, people it, devote their entire life. To yeah, yeah, this. no, no, and, and I, I like playing with two hands. It's, it's a lot yeah. easier for me. So, um, so that took up a lot of time, and uh, you know, I, uh, I did stuff outside. I'm a skier. I like to ski. So in the winter time, you know, we're outside. I go skiing with friends anyway, and. Uh, nice. We were fine. So uh, we got through it. You have a full balanced life, man. You really do. 
I'm looking at some of these um, uh, accolades. 2,500 performances. That's somewhere in your wiki on the line. Yeah, I stopped and counting. I stopped counting. Um, you know, when you're playing 42 years and, you you know, you're working pretty much, you know, I took time off. I maybe have four weeks off during the year. And, you know, playing sometimes pops, we'd play eight shows a week or 10 shows during Christmas to be triple days, triple service days. Wow. You know, and you just do three shows and uh, you're just living, breathing music. It adds, you know, I, 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 I kind of laugh because I think of how many times I played Sleigh Ride. You know, I probably, probably paid for my house. I don't wow. know. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, I find myself. The music's in my folder, and I open it up, but I'm not even looking at it. I'm thinking, why do I even open the music up? Yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, you, uh, you you had mentioned a Bernstein before, Leonard Bernstein, the yeah. movie Maestro. Well, I know you had my pal Kenny Aronoff on. Yeah. On the podcast, and Kenny and I were students together out at Tanglewood for the Boston Symphony Fellowship Program. Wow, you're there Bernstein at the same time. Bernstein conducted us. Amazing. And um, there's a picture in his book of him with Bernstein, and I'm the guy – Who's back, you see. <laughs> we were talking to Bernstein. But Kenny and I used to hang out, and uh, that's just when he, he hooked up with um, uh, uh, John Cooter. Camp. And yeah. he went, cause I was trying to convince him to open a drum shop with me in Boston. I was, and then he went out to – I said, what the hell are you going? Indiana. We went to Indiana University, but I said, really? You're going to go play with a guy? It's interesting the decisions we make because then another I, I somewhere along in his one of the stories of in his early days was he could have gotten a job in the Jerusalem Symphony or with um there was like uh like a Johnny Mathis uh -huh. I think he got offered the job with Johnny Mathis uh -huh. or an audition with Johnny Mathis. can you imagine so but well, we're I guess we're called because, to these paths you know he's like you 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 have a percussion background yeah you know he played drums but uh. You know, he's Mr. Rock and Roll drummer now, and uh, I see him usually at the shows of when I used to go to Nam, and yeah, we we used to we used to hang out. And that was funny, yeah. But Bernstein was unbelievable. You know, as good as he may appear in the movie, uh, to yeah. be uh, Bradley Cooper playing him, he was one of the great musical geniuses of our time. He was, and he was friends with Copeland. Did you work with Copeland as well? I did work yeah. with Copeland. Like one summer, both Copeland. And Bernstein were there. And I got to play West Side Story with, with Bernstein. And, you know, West Side Story, the percussion part, it's written, there's a big mambo section. And and the bongo part is written just 16th. And it seemed really, like, boring to me. So I went up to him. I said, excuse me, Maestro, I want to ask you about the bongo part. He said, you know, he said, oh, man, yeah, yeah. It needs to be busier. I want you to really. He, I said, well, do you want me to? play what you wrote. He says, I didn't know how the hell to write for bongos. He said, Sid Raymond, who was one of the arrangers of the show, and I were going uptown in New York listening to Machito and all the Latin bands. We loved the percussion. We just didn't know how to write what they're playing. Yeah. So do what you're going to. And there, so there's a, there's a, you know, there's an example of where I don't recall ever hearing anybody else playing anything except those sick boring they get, they get, they get, they get the static and you had little you added little accents and stuff oh people. yeah yeah i was playing bongo you Some know people I, court action there yeah yeah i was playing a mambo i was you know i i, I took a few lessons with a, a a cat here at berkeley and it's okay i'm gonna i'm gonna try and do this authentic style Ooh, nice but the yeah. fact that you asked and it, that is cool and you know what i really like I, there's a, this kind of like there's just respect and reverence for um, you know, composers and conductors where you call them maestro. And I was watching that show, The Bear, that won all the awards on FX. It's about a guy who owns, um, he takes over his family's hot sandwich business in Chicago and then slowly but surely tries to turn it into an upscale dining experience. And he, it, out of respect, all chefs and the people working in the kitchen call chef. They're all calling each other chef, chef, uh -huh. chef. And it's like a French brigade. And it's like, I just, I just like the, the reverence for people that. Right. Well, it's like a guy, you go out on a charter boat, you call captain. him captain or, or, yeah. the, or the woman captain. Uh, yeah. They're, they're, but you know, they drum set players, we just get bro, dude. <laughs> what's, you know, what's up, bro? What's up? What's up, bro? What's up, dude? But I mean, what a list of people you work with. John Williams, Johnny Math yeah, there's Williams. Johnny Mathis, Gladys Knight. I did work with Mathis, actually, a long, long time ago. But yeah. uh, 
John John Williams. I mean, Bernstein and John Williams, probably the two greatest musical figures, I believe, of our time. Uh, I mean, John Williams personally requested you for some shows. I read somewhere for the Star Wars in concert. Yeah, they sent out for eleven weeks a ninety-piece orchestra with um, doing music from all six movies. Three yeah. conductors, wow. all one-nighters, bus and truck. I wasn't going to go. I mean, I, it was a it was a separate thing, but um, they needed somebody. It was a lot of young kids at a New World Symphony, young place, hot players. I mean, yeah. the fiddle players, the fingers were burning. It's it's unbelievable the technique. They needed kind of an older, um, you know, camp counselor to go, who would play. So I, I, I played snare drum, and that we had a we had a great seven person percussion section, tuned wood blocks, tuned cowbells, boo bams. We this is the only time, Rich, in my whole career we had a drum tech. I nice. Don't have, I show up at an orchestra. I got to set my stuff up. This, you know, he had a he had a lecture me to stop setting up the snare drum. I was, that, yeah, I got it. I got yeah, it. Yeah, and, and one night uh, in some arena, I left my favorite pair of drumsticks on on the on the drum, and I thought they're gone. The next night, I I show up, the drum set up, the sticks are on the drum in exactly the same orientation. Yes. That I, I, come, I don't I mean, hear you don't hear much about classical drum techs. You know what I mean? Where like somebody is you know, it doesn't exist knowledgeable <laughs> enough to. Well, that's nice because they realize, hey, man, these people are maybe they're not used to sleeping on a moving tour bus. And they're maybe right. let's, let's give them the best. Right. Let, let's exactly right. That's let's spoil them. And we have stage hands, but usually they're, yeah. they're cranky. And yes, I'm going to do something. And they, they tell you a way to stick it. But how, that's how, how was the catering? How was the catering? Was it all right? Catering, I thought was great. I, I thought it was, uh, you know, but it was it was uh, quite an interesting, like you say, it was a, a bus buses, one nighters. Uh, it was hard work and uh, it was very rewarding. It just was great. We had three terrific conductors that they rotated and um, it was it was and, and to hear John's music from all at the time, there were six movies, all six movies. Together, they had a big LED screen and a and a exhibit that traveled with us of all the costumes. Awesome, and and it was it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. Now now, how did how did John's composing or the percussion scoring change over the course of the six films? Did you see like, or was it all like, was it a brand, a sonic brand, where it's all it's all kind of pretty much? You know, it's it's. Um, it's pretty consistent across what I saw across Star Wars. Of course, he varies it so much. One of my favorite movies is Catch Me If You Can with Leonardo. Yeah. John did the music, and it's got the hardest jazz vibraphone part. I don't think I could play it, but uh, a guy, I think on the West Coast, Alan Estes did it. And, and you know, John's originally a jazz musician. He was originally Johnny Williams and, and his orchestra. I did not song. know that. Some old records. Yeah. And his dad was a drummer. His dad was a famous drummer for Kate Smith hmm. in New York. And his two brothers are percussionists. So he likes drummers and he likes writing his for whole drums. His family is, you know, so, uh, but he's just, uh, not only is he just a, a musical genius, but he's the nicest guy you'd want to meet. Humble. I mean, if anybody could have an ego, he could. Yeah. I mean, he's had more Academy Award nominations than anybody. Yeah, was he like eighty five now or something? Oh, he's well, up. He just got another one for Indiana Jones. Yeah, because I saw him at the at the last Oscars. He was in the audience, and uh, you know, Spielberg has got to have him. Oh no, it, no! Well, he did Jaws. He did the first movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did every every Spielberg movie. What's funny is, you know, after his concerts, people line up to see him. Oh, dignitary! I mean, everybody wants to support him. I would. I'd be leaving the hall. You know, just trying to get out to my car. I want to get home. I don't want to bother anybody. And one day I, I'm walking. There's a line of people waiting to go say hello to him in the dressing room. I'm walking by, just trying to sneak by. His dressing room door opens. He sees me. He says, Neil, baby, come on in. And I walk in and he closes the door. And I'm sure everybody on the line thought, who the hell is that guy? He just cut the line, you know, but uh, uh, just a, a very, very, very cool guy. Very cool. I've been very lucky. I mean, I really, Rich, have been 
you know, um, no, luck. you worked hard and you had the eye on the prize. Yeah. But but, you know, also you have to have, you know, a lot of people help me along the way. I'm a big I'm a big proponent of paying it forward. Sure. You know, look, people help me. I want to help others if I can. And and the truth is, as they say, giving is more rewarding. Uh, giving is more rewarding than receiving. And I know that sounds like BS. Yeah, no, it does feel good. You know, if I could help a young musician and do something, I feel much better. Yeah. If, if I didn't. Neil, I don't know about you. I love that philosophy, but I currently, right now, I, I even my book, I just took a year to write this book, Making It in Country Music. It was just a calling. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. it was like 50 years in the making and it took a year to do. Yeah. Um, but I talk about coffee and, and, and floating away on a river of coffee. I currently have about eight people that are trying to get together with me and buy me a cup of coffee to pick my brain. Uh -huh. And and to, for me, that's like giving back. It's like, yeah. how can I fit this in, man? You know, I'm like, hey, I can give you 20 minutes. This is the address yeah, of the Starbucks, yeah, you yeah. know. Oh, um, there are people who will take advantage and you got to you have to protect yourself. Yeah, it's but hard if you have something, you know, um, but there's no subsidy. I mean, you, we could help people, but they got to have the goods. Yeah, and, and it, it, it's it's. Uh, and then what do you do if the person doesn't have the goods? You just politely just you don't return the text or you'd be like, uh, that's the tough one because they yeah, know that you have given your time to other people. Well, this is a dilemma. Uh, I Once in a while, I'll have some friends say, look, I have this friend and his his uh, daughter wants to be a professional percussionist. Would you talk to them about what it's like? And is it a good thing to major in? And I always try and encourage with a dose of reality you know it's it's a tough tough field it always has been at least from my end of things it's getting worse there's fewer <laughs> jobs oh, what, what, what? You know, there's fewer jobs is look i knew if the if the crap hit the fan and i got fired from an orchestra i could always survive playing weddings and bar mitzvahs i did it in high school i could do it yes. but they don't hire live musicians anymore so well, a city like Boston, Dallas, Los Angeles, you know, play places where there's money and you know debutantes. Yeah, occasionally, but but like I play the circus, that's not around. The ice capades gone. Oh, you know, it's all pre-recorded. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of the work that was live is you know is is gone away. So as long as they enter with their eyes open and have a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. Nice. Okay. Cause a lot of other people will be like, have zero backup plans. But for me, my black, my back, uh, backup plan was a no brainer. My backup plan was, um, get really good at teaching, having a curriculum and realizing the power of music education. And then you could always teach full time. If you had to, I've never had to teach full time, but I've teaching has always been a part of my musical diet. Right. Right. But then that's a good reason to have a degree. Yeah. I need to teach full time. You would need that degree. Yeah, so that's part of a backup plan. Uh, you know, it's um, um, but it, you know, I, I I'm conscious. I remember, you know, I remember being young and just having a dream and following that dream, and nobody was going to talk me out of it. Uh, and I don't, you know, I I I feel I don't want to rain on anyone's parade, but they do have to be re realistic. Today, some of these schools cost ridiculous money. Oh, sixty thousand a semester. Uh, it's, crazy. Or, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So you know, I hate to see kids come out of school with debt. I think that's yeah. a big mistake. I think go, you don't have to go to that sixty thousand dollars school. Go to a you know, go to a state school or a community college and take private lessons with somebody. You yeah, know? there's the SUNY schools, and you know, oh, Texas. Good. I think I think my entire education in the state of Texas for a four year degree would have been half of what one year is at Belmont University here in yeah. Nashville. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's. It's in, it's incredibly expensive, and you know I don't know how someone who comes out of school with a hundred thousand dollars in debt pays that back. Especially if they become a, even if you become a percussion instructor at a big five A high school in Texas, and it's salaried, and there's how are you going to pay that back? It's going to take forever. 
Yeah, yeah, it's 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 something to think about. Well, on a more positive note, I've always respected the fact that you are a, a, a drumpreneur. You're a solopreneur. You're the epitome of having an entrepreneurial spirit. And we all know that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Is that how Grover Pro started? Yeah. Yes, it, it started. I'm the accidental entrepreneur. That's what I call myself. Um, I never intended. I, I fought it. I tried to kill it. I try to run the company into the ground numerous times and I could not kill it. This is amazing to hear. It started, I was playing at Boston Symphony, standing next to Vic Firth. We're playing Scheherazade by Rimsky Korsakov, which if people don't know what that is, listen to it. It's, it's one of the greatest pieces of classical music. And I'm playing triangle. And Vic hands me an old beady triangle, says, use this triangle. This is the best sounding triangle I've ever heard. And it belongs to the orchestra. And I struck that triangle, Rich, and it sounded like a beautiful K Zildjian cymbal, but much yeah. higher in pitch. Yeah. I said, oh my God, I never heard. So I'm playing it and I'm thinking about it. I said, this just looks like a bent piece of metal. Why does this sound so much better than anything else I've heard that looks exactly the same? I asked Vic, I asked some of the other guys, nobody knew. No, I'm not a believer in magic. I said, there's a reason, but I, but, I didn't know what it was. Well, I had a friend across the river from Boston is Cambridge, Mass, mm -hmm. and MIT is there. And I had a friend, a student at MIT, a brilliant engineering kind of kid. And I called him. I said, I'm going to come over. I, I, and he played the, he was a viol amateur violinist. Gotcha. I said, look, here's a triangle. I hit a bad one. And I said, here's a great one. And I said, I want to know what the hell's going on. And he said to me, you know, let me take you to my acoustics and vibrations uh, department chair. He's an amateur flute player. He'll be very interested. So I go to see the guy. I, he's very interested. He assigns a graduate student to basically reverse engineer the thing. And he hands me kind of a formula, like a blueprint. He said, this is what you have to do. You have to bend. You have to use this alloy and bend it at this temperature. But, so now I'm looking at this thing. How the hell am I going to do this? So... I, in Boston at the time, there was a big shipyard left over from World War II, and there were still blacksmiths there. Wow. So I went to go see a blacksmith. I said, look, I showed him the triangle. I said, here's what they told me I need to do. Can you do this? He said, yeah, come back in a week and bring 20 bucks. So, 20 okay. bucks? Well, it was 1979. Ah, so, so and what the other, te the other triangles on the market was like, were there like the Alan Abel one? Well, Alan had just started, but I never, it always sounded very pitched to me like a bell. The difference between a triangle and a cymbal and a bell is that a bell has definite pitch and um, cymbals, triangles have indefinite pitch, should have indefinite pitch. And that's a whole, another whole conversation, which we could have if you care to. But to make a long story short, I went back to him, brought the 20 bucks. He handed me a triangle. I brought a clip and a beater with me. I put it on. I hit it. I said, oh, my God. It sounds did exactly it. like it. So now, the next day, I'm at Symphony Hall playing Scheherazade. And I, instead of using the symphony's triangle, I have mine, the copy. And I'm playing it. And the guys are looking at me. And they see the symphony triangle on the trap table. And they, so they after say, what were you using? I said, well, that's my triangle. I had a cop. Oh, you got to have one for me. I said, no, nah, come on. You got to have one. I want one. So I said, okay, give me 20 bucks. I mean, I made, I was I didn't think about making money. I, so I went back to the guys. I need three more. Here's 60 bucks. To make a long story short, a few, week, few weeks go by, I get a call from Doug Howard, who used to be the principal percussionist in Dallas. He had just uh, got Yes, me. yes. Okay. Neil, this is Doug Howard. Uh, I hear you're in the triangle business. I said, no, no, I'm not. He says, well, Dean Anderson at Berkeley told me you make the greatest. Yeah, I got to have one. I said, oh, God. Okay. S send me 20 bucks. It, you know, so it took, I started getting calls. And one day I pick up the phone and it's 1980. And I hear, is this Neil Grover? I said, yeah. This is Harvey Vogel at Lone Star Percussion. Yeah, Harvey Vogel. Yeah. Uh, how much are your triangles? I said, I'm not selling triangles. He said, yes, you are. I want to, I'll buy a dozen. I said, I don't even know what to charge you. He said, well, how much does it cost you? I said, $20. So Harvey told me about markup. You know, I, I wasn't even thinking like a bit. I had no business. No, after. you were just making them for the flat rate that it cost to make it. So, to make a long story short, uh, 
And the next year, I I went to the first Pasuk I ever went to. I think it was the third, second or third one. It was in Indianapolis. Still and is. I had, <laughs> I, yeah, I had, I had a two dozen triangles made, and I got a little card table and a sign I cut out by hand and mimeographed priceless. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Yes. And I just prayed I sold everything. Um, I was charging $40. I prayed I sold everything, so I at least covered my expenses. Yes. Well, all the triangles sold in the first hour. First hour. Amazing. And I had three days to sit there, and I thought, hey, there's something here. What? So then I came home. I took orders. I came home, and I started thinking about it. I said, maybe this might be a cool thing to do. And uh, that's when I started. Uh, it was in my home for a couple of years. Then I got the home next to me and we had walkie talkies. That's how we talked to each other. And I got into trouble because UPS would come and block the street for like 20 minutes <laughs> delivering stuff. And take. so then we finally moved into a bigger facility and it started growing and growing. And that has its own issues. But that, that's how it started. I, I never intended. To, wow. To, to so it, unintentional businessman. But the thing is, is that the product was undeniable. Well, people weren't taking it seriously. And I always thought, you know what? I'm, I'm in the symphony orchestra. It's like I tell this story. I had a friend, a great fiddle player and the first violins. We went to school together. And one day he says to me, hey, Neil, do you ever feel foolish playing the triangle back there? And I didn't answer. I said, well, Joe, let me ask you a question. How many notes are you playing tonight? He says, I don't know. I said, take a guess. A hundred, a thousand, five thousand. He said, oh, at least 10,000. I said, okay, let's say it's 10,000 notes. So based roughly on what we're both getting paid tonight, you're making about four cents a note. I said, tonight, while you're playing those 10,000 notes, every time you hear the triangle, I want you to think there's $20 in this pocket. Boom. So think about that. Yeah. Think, think it, really it, fools, yeah. It's like the actor that has pages and pages of dialogue before, the, as, as opposed to the guy that comes in and goes, where's the party? They're getting paid the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, look, playing the triangle isn't as hard as playing a violin. But what, what you do, what I do, we're playing so many different instruments, techniques. That's the difficulty of percussion. And it's important. And it's yeah. important that the triangle have a really good sound. Well, what was the, so you changed the triangle game and, um, what was the next instrument? Was it the tambourines? tambourines? Were next. Yeah. yeah, we we I used to buy ta cheap tambourines, take them apart, rebuild them. Because uh, I had a friend who used to do that with hot rods, and he used to just it was like a chop shop. You know, <laughs> you take the shell and put in better jing better jingles. We take out the shell. I take the shell, pop out the jingles. I tri and originally I used to take the jingles and beat the hell out of them with a hammer, put them in an oven, heat them up, cool them. But then I started buying sheet metal and cutting them by hand. Wow. Then I bought an anvil, and then I bought a machine that stamped out the basic shape, and then ovens, and it it just grew and grew. What amazing! Wow. Well, and then I don't know what it was, but you just seem like a very approachable, affable guy. Like, I got to talk to this character. And I think we met each other at a NAM show. It could have been a PAS. I introduced myself a couple years later. Um, you're taking some input from me. Let's let's make a Studio oh, yeah. Pro yeah. Tamarine. You're really helpful in, in our Studio Pro series and helping me. Because I don't know the type of work you do. I had heard, I think, at one time Eric Darkin told me, you guys used to rip the heads off of tambourines. I said, oh, my God, don't yeah. do that. Yeah. Don't do that. So you were very helpful and instrumental mm -hmm. in, in us uh, uh, developing. Like, by the way, there's a new model on the way to you as we speak. You know? Really? NAM is this week, and there's a new one being released this week, a brilliant copper model you'll have. Awesome. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so it was great, you know, and I, I really enjoyed seeing you at the shows. And, of course, I follow what you're doing and, and your, your motivational speaking and your, your crash course. And you, oh. you're, you're an entrepreneur. I mean, you're oh, a man. busy cat. Well, we see that in each other for sure, man. Well, thanks for, you know, taking the input. I mean, it's like it is an amazing product. It is, a, it is the best-sounding tambourine in the world, and it'll take a beating. I have tons of them that I have took with a butter knife and I took the head off in the early days. And then I have the ones where you guys got really slick and you put like a nice little rubber grommet rubber around. Channel on there. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can hit it with a stick and you can yeah, hit it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 I've heard some um, recordings that it's on and I have to say it really, 
It, it cuts. Really is a nice sound for that. Yeah, there's, yeah. I mean, there's there's a time and place for almost any manufacturer's tambourine yes, because they yeah. all have different thicknesses and double right. double rolls and triple rolls and but it's, I sometimes they sound like a plastic toy. And 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 your tambourine is is a big boy, all grown up tambourine. You know, every jingle's hammered individually, and they're all slightly different. It's like a chorus of people with different vocal qualities, but when it blends, it's a beautiful, warm sound. That's oh. we used to we used to think about uh, voicing the jingles. I mean, we'd actually voice them, but um, you know, it's. Uh, it, it, yeah, like you say, we're we're ba we're artists. We just paint with sound. Yeah, and we use technique and different instruments. But we need a palette, like like a painter has a palette of different colors and mixes it. Yeah, so that's why we need all this junk. Oh God, it's not. I mean, I'm I'm looking at a room just full of drums from different eras. You can have a modern drum set. You can have the Beatles yeah. drum set. You can have the green bottom Vista light. You can have the super slick Birch Yamaha recording customs. Yeah, yeah. You grab snare drums from around the world and every little shaker's got a story and every right, symbol is like, right. oh, that was given to me. That was the first symbol that Sabian gave me. Like, yeah. And there's the emotional attachment to the to these instruments. Now, right. the, the a big question for someone like you who owns so many different things is, do you take the time to catalog them and insure them or not? Uh, yeah, I don't catalog them. I have kind of a blanket policy that will cover yeah. most of them. Yeah, um, I try cataloging and my mallets, and I know a lot of people do. I, I just don't have the patience no. to sit there for a week marking everything down. The big stuff I fought, you know, fought for Ludwig Timpani, you know, yeah, two marimbas, Lady Xylophone, the big yeah. stuff. But I didn't want to get into all the little stuff. Now the timpani is there's a timpani technology to the point now where you can almost be a foolproof amazing timpanist with like tuning no, gauges and stuff, no. or do you have to have still like it hasn't changed? There has been no improvement at all. You have to have a super ear. That's all there is to it. You need a good sense of pitch. And yes, need, it's still it, it's and it's, and guys are going back to using calf heads now. Oh really? And that's changing the weather and changing by the minute. Yeah. Ooh. And. Yeah, you. It, if you don't have a good sense of pitch, you, you're not going to be. But now, why going back to the calf? That some seems like just shooting yourself in the foot. It's you know, it's a, it's kind of a trend, and a lot of conductors like it. I remember Vic cursing it, and he was so happy to go to plastic because when it rained or anything, the heat was on, it didn't change its uh, pitch. But the sound quality of a plastic head is not as beautiful as a. Yes. You know, but those calf heads, those timpani heads are like $600 each. So the only ones who can afford them are orchestras, you know, yeah. who, who have a lot of money. Uh, you know, I, I just, um, yeah, you know, things go around in fads. So what's old is new again. What, what, kind, what kind of head would you have on the snare drum for the Star Wars concert? I was using like a fiber skin, a Remo fiber skin. I really like that head. Fiber skins are nice, man. Yeah, it's a great head. I, 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 I've loved the Remo products uh, uh, going way back. I, I knew Remo Belly. They were very nice to me, Lord McClausland. And um, yeah, the fiber skin. I, I've always liked that fiber skin head. Yeah. Okay, so then you have this company where you're you're making these, you're changing the world one triangle at a time. Then you make these world class tambourines, and then next might be the castanets or yeah, it's castanet. Uh, it just kept growing, and yeah. you know, because once we developed something and it went into production, I kind of lost interest. Yeah, the, the, you know, the Frankensteining was done. Yeah, I, what's the next thing? What what can what can we improve? What, what you do like we you you like the puttering? I love the R and D and the puttering, the trial and error. How are we going to do this? And so, I mean, so, so you got the company was a good forty years. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the, the, the official start date we incorporated in nineteen eighty. I sold it in twenty nineteen to RBI Music. Okay. Um, of uh, in in Texas, they're in Fort Worth. It's now part of the Toka a parent company so yes talk it together it makes a lot of sense you know music companies it's like pharmacies you rarely see an independent pharmacy anymore that's cvs it's walgreens Wal yeah because it's so expensive and difficult to be independent well we were a small company like mike balter mallets and a lot of mallet tech a lot of the other boutique companies and it's be became increasingly difficult to stay a solo act and 
I have one son and he has no interest in the company. It wasn't his passion, which I respect. He has a life went a totally different direction. He loves what he does. He's a pilot. Oh. And, and, you know, um, I'd rather have it under the guidance and umbrella of a good company. That's not going to move it all to China. That was, ah. I had two, two uh, requirements. It had to stay in the U S right. And you had to offer everybody who worked for me a job. Oh, okay, great. Whether so they no took it or not was up to them. Uh, they relocated to Texas. They offered everybody. We had to take it. You know, I can understand they don't want to move, but I wanted to protect. It was like a family to me. That's incredible. Well, at one point, how many employees did you have at the highest? The highest was about 14. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they mostly, all except our chief financial officer were were drummers uh, percussionists i wanted it was important for me somebody picked something up if it didn't feel right they they knew right away now did you act as the ceo or did you hire a ceo oh, no, i i did it i um i did it because um uh, i'm kind of a control type of person i went back to school took some courses in uh business, business? yeah accounting. um i learned a lot i read a lot I made a lot of mistakes, but you know what, Rich? I never minded making a mistake because I, I saw it as an opportunity to learn. I never beat myself up. I, as long as I can not make it a second time and learn something from it, it's a lesson. Yes. So, so, so I, was the, I was the default. I never called myself a CEO. But a lot of guys do. To me, a chief executive officer has 200 employees minimum. Gotcha. I was the president. You know, as yeah, the, you're president. Yeah. But that. it's really impressive that your day job is playing in a major symphony, one of the greatest. And yeah. then your fun thing is you're a small business owner, and then the small business becomes a bigger business, a successful right. business. And then, of course, the American dream, uh, getting your companies val evaluated and then selling the company. Well, selling it was a two-year process, and it's very difficult to evaluate a co small company because it to have a, a – uh, an assessment come in and do a, 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 a an estimate of its value cost cost a hundred thousand dollars. Well, it's not worth. So, so it's just you know it's a small industry. I know everybody. So I, you skipped that. You basically were just like we're yeah, not going to yeah, do that. Yeah. Well, my gonna... brother was in business, and we knew about is um you know I tell people when you watch Shark Tank, I went through that. You know, I had investors at one time, valuation. I mean, before I sold the company, in order to grow it. You need fertilizer. Well, that's money. Yes. And I, I'm just, you know, I'm a musician. I have limited amount of money. I was all in. Now I got to borrow money. The bank only would loan me so much. I needed more. So I, I brought in investors. Mm -hmm. uh, I They bought, they own 40% of the company. But the investors were great because every month we had a meeting. They would rake me over the coals if I needed raking over the coals. Okay, I could take it. But when I had a question or I needed help understanding something. They were all business people. They knew they, they taught me. So I, well, that's great. And, and who, what, who are the type of people that have enough money sitting around? Like I'll take a chance with a small percussion. I mean, talk about a niche product. Well, the people, a, who love music, one yeah. the people who made a lot of money in the dot com gotcha. era and could do anything they want and love what they loved our mission they loved that we were made in america that we were high end that it was used all over the world by people like you and by symphony orchestras and and on soundtracks and they wanted to be around us it was just because it was a cool environment yeah so in a way it was kind of a vanity project for them to me they were putting in what i considered a significant sum of money but to some people who fly on private jets, it's nothing. It's 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 lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's different levels of private jets because I've I've flown on a couple where it's just like we're you know we're in New York and you're doing Letterman and the next day you got to be doing something on the West and so yeah. like we'll take a private jet yeah. and they're not always as they're as you know they're not always as spacious and right, 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 looking right. like in like something off like entourage on hbo it's like right 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 right, right. there's but a I, cold chicken salad sandwich and here's your wine in a plastic cup well, 
you know. I'm in the last row with JetBlue, so I'll gladly <laughs> trade with you anytime. I'm a Southwest man. Oh, okay. I'll tell you, I'm a Southwest man all the way. People were like, you know, I have friends that are like, why do you fly the Greyhound to the skies? I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, because they're the nicest people. Mm-hmm, you yeah. can change your flight with no problems and you, right. your luggage is free. Right, right. I'm in. You well, know? we used to, when we traveled with the Boston Pops and Symphony, we'd use a charter outfit that the Patriots or the Red Sox would use. We'd use the same operator. So it was a charter, you know, 737, yeah. no assigned seat. Well, our pianist was a great jazz pianist. And he taught at Berkeley, always used to go to the back of the plane and sit there. And I one day I said, Bob, why are you always sitting in the last row? Why don't you come up front closer to where we are? And he said to me, you never heard of a plane backing into a mountain. <laughs> so, so he was afraid to sit up front. That's amazing. Oh, my God. It's like the scene from Almost Famous where the drummer's in the back and he thinks he's going to die. And yeah, oh, yeah. he has a, a moment of clarity. Now, there's a, a fun little uh, thing on the, on the wiki that it says you were actually an on-camera percussionist in the film Blown Away with Jeff Bridges and Tommy Lee Jones. I am. They they That movie is about a, the Boston Bomb Squad and, and a bomber, but one of the leads is a woman supposed to be the concert mistress of the Boston Pops. So they needed some musicians to fill out background in a scene. So they said, you want to do it? I said, sure. I'd never done that before. It was the most boring thing I've ever done in my life. I was standing, standing in the back of the hat shell where we play in the summer, just standing there for hours while they're setting up shots and, and uh, you know, um, but if, if you if you don't blink, you may be able to see me. That's amazing. Oh. I'm going to have to rewatch that because I know I saw it in the time that it came out. Now, Neil, you're also an author, several books, right? One of which, The Art of Tambourine and Triangle, Meredith Music. Right. With Gar Whaley, I wrote that. Oh, and, nice. Uh, uh, I wrote a book for Mallet Primer when I was teaching at UMass and Boston Conservatory. It was a yes. book of exercises I used to use with my own students to transition them from two to four mallets easily. So that's out. And um, um, yeah, just a couple of things. I, I, I'm not really uh, prolific at all, but I had a couple of things that I wrote that I'm, I'm proud of. Did you enjoy that process? It, it, it's for me, I, I did three books and it, it's it's a process. It's I, I don't know if I enjoyed it. It was a lot of hard work. Um, I just um, I prefer to be tinkering around in a machine shop. Yeah. You know, trying to build a machine to do something to help make something. So I did it. Um, I wouldn't say I'm good at it, but uh, I wouldn't say it's something I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. Well, and also they probably came out at a time when publishing yielded uh, greater gains. You know what I mean? Because I'll get a check sometimes from my Amazon publishing. Oh. And it's like, thanks, Jeff Bezos. Uh, I'll go get a hamburger. Yeah, well, I my, my stuff sells not many copies. You know, if they sell a few hundred a year, that's a lot. So yeah, yeah. yeah it's, 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 timing, timing. You know, when Carmine was writing his realistic rock book on napkins and nightclubs, right. he was the first non-buttoned up, uh, you, you know, zebra shirt wearing rock drummer to put out a method book. So that was amazing time. I think he sold a million copies. Um, in fact, when I when I was a teenager, I was a huge Vanilla Fudge fan because they're they're from New York. They Heck were, yeah, they were great. They're a great great group. Yeah, I was just uh, I was just in uh, the city. I went to go. I heard ten languages in the in the pursuit of a uh, the perfect bagel and the perfect slice. So much energy in the city, fantastic. And then uh, I was out in Long Island because my girlfriend's from Smithtown. Oh, I know Smithtown. Yeah, sure. yeah, she born and raised in Smithtown. So one more interesting factoid that I found on the interwebs: How was your gig with Aerosmith? What was that? Well, I actually I, I've done a couple of things with them. I did a recording session once. They did a they did an album don't uh, just push play. Yeah. They they wanted to make it like Sgt. Pepper with orchestral instruments. So I got the call, would you come in and lay the percussion down? Sure. So uh, they weren't exactly sure what they wanted. So I just I had Cartage take a whole bunch of stuff over there into one of the studios downtown Boston. And I show up. And I'm in the studio, and Steve Tyler and Joey Crane, the whole band is there, and they're, and they're working with the strings. They get done with the strings, and uh, now I'm going to start. And I had my glockenspiel from home I put in the back of my car, and my car was in the lot. I, and as I said, 
hey, Steve, I just got to go out and get my Glock. I'll be right back. And he says, well, you have a Glock? I said, yeah, I have two Glocks. He says, you should come over to my house sometime. I said, okay, well, what are we going to do? He says, we're going to shoot. I said, what are we going to shoot? He said, the Glocks. I said, why would I want to shoot my Glock? I said, he said, what are you talking about? I said, a Glockenspiel. What are you talking about? A gun. I had no idea the Glock's a the gun. The Glock. Oh, my the God. were hysterical. He got uh, all excited that you guys were going to, like, you know, shoot. Yeah, I thought we going to play, like, Christmas music or something. He's going to sing. Uh, I'll play on the Glockenspiel. But to make a long story short, it was an all-night session. It, they didn't know what they wanted. The arranger was not really that good. And the, the whole thing got cut out. They didn't uh, use any of the orchestral stuff. Uh, you know, I, I asked the manager because when I got my check, uh, the manager called me, he said, thank you, but we're not going to use anything. And I said, that must have cost you guys a fortune. And he basically said, what these guys, you know, are used to making, it, it isn't a fortune to them. Yeah, they wanted yeah. to try it. It didn't work. Uh, let's see. I was going, that's interesting, because you, but you still got paid. You know, oh, yeah, our, our, the money was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got to meet the guys, you know, Steve Tyler. And this was now, was that on the card or off the card? On what, what was on the it? card, like the union card. Oh, oh, no, it was union. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in Boston, you don't, you can't do something non union. That's great. It's, it's good that there's still that kind of power because, oh, you know, yeah, Nashville yeah. is a Tennessee's a right to work state. So, well, the we're not, that's the difference. And yeah. we're like New York, you know, if you. If you take non-union work, your union work will dry up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't do that. Interesting. So, Neil, where do you get the uh, – you probably know where to get the best bagel in New York City, but is there a best bagel in Boston? Well, as a transplanted New Yorker, New Yorker, these New Englanders don't know how to make bagels, Rich. I am just – Well, you got to have the New York City water, right? It's that, the water. It's, it's the, the water. It's so, water. you know, so um, when friends go to New York or if I'm down, I always buy, buy them and I freeze them. And it, it, it's this is not a bagel town. Yeah. Now, you yeah. got to go to the source. You know, the funny thing is, is that, you know, if I lived in New England, man, I between the carbohydrates of the pizza and the carbohydrates of the I yeah. would be huge well, that's the problem. That is the problem. <laughs> See, I'm with you. I mean, no. I'm like a Dave's bread guy. Like I, I, I eat the lowest calorie Dave's bread. And then I feel guilty if I have a little smear of, of yeah. whipped cream, you know, but when in New when I'm in New York, all bets are off. We're getting the bagel and I get the inside scooped and I get it toasted dark. And then I get the uh, vegan veggie spread. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, growing up. I, we had hot bagels every Sunday. Sunday morning, I mean, you know, there were all these bagel places, bacon, all, all, you know, but New York, Zabar's, H and H bagels. I don't know if any of those are still around, but uh, you're not going to find, find get the lenders bagels. I think they might still be in yeah. business. Yeah. <laughs> Entenmann's, Entenmann's. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. like the Entenmann's coffee cake. Oh, oh that, my God. Yeah, yeah. That stuff. So Neil, I don't want to keep you too long. It's so fun spending this time with you. But looking back at this illustrious career, you're doing everything. You're contracting. You're composing. You're teaching. You're writing books. You're doing clinics. You created products. You kept a, two awesome jobs for over 40 years. Any super fond memories? Is it going to find its way into a memoir? Oh, that's that's really interesting. Uh, I, th I think you should do one, man. Uh you know, if I had the patience to sit down, maybe if I could find somebody I could dictate it to and they yeah. could. Oh, you need a co-author, a co-author or a ghost yeah, author. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or a ghost writer or something. I don't know how that works. But, you know, the bottom line, Rich, is I feel really good about what I've done. I, I've always tried to do it with integrity, with honesty, being nice to people. Because oh, yeah. Dad told me when I was young, be nice to people on the way up. They're the same people you're going to meet on the way down. Yes, That's exactly right. So, um, you know, I, I look, I was a, I was a kid dreaming about playing in Carnegie Hall. I did it. So yeah, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Yeah, you take a left at the uh, <laughs> you ah! you practice yeah, practice. But but um, it's, it, you know, it's just the people, the people I've met along the way uh, are just it, it, it's made it all worthwhile. Yeah, so of really course. Cool. Now, you know, what? What um, you have this vast uh, family of percussion instruments. What which which instrument feels the most like home that you enjoy the most when you get a part passed out? You're like, oh, I'm on snare drum today. Oh, I'm on piatti today. I'm this is gonna shock you. It's cymbals, piatti. 
Okay. I love playing symbols. Um, I have a huge symbol collection. Some of my K's are over a hundred years old. Wow. And I have um, Zildjian has done some custom stuff for me over the years. The thing is that the, the expressiveness of symbols and the different colors you can get is just feels so incredible to me. Uh, I, I always, I mean, that's what I played mostly, but if, if anyone asks me, you know, people, if I'm guest playing somewhere like I do in Florida, sometimes they all think I want to play tambourine. I said, I don't want to play. I want to play cymbals. Yeah. By that, you know, I said, no, I like playing cymbals. Interesting. Now, is it still, you know, so you think about my outgoing personality, uh, my demeanor, my showmanship. I'm back in the playing in the symphony. And of course, man, when I played cymbals, you let those things spread like an eagle and you let them hang and just the vibrate. Is that still a thing where you, where you're well, encouraged there is to let a them school that lets them hang. I'm yeah. not from that school because I hear a phase shift, you know, the symbol, the sound is coming out from the symbol vibrating out right. the edge of the symbol. And when you, if that's, you hit them together, strike them, it's horizontal. Uh, it's vertical. If you hang them horizontal, I hear this. <sighs> I hear like a filter going over it, and I don't like it. Ah, so I, I don't do that. I don't. I can do see that. I, I can see that. Motion. I I have a heart shaped motion, a flam. You know, you need a nice flam so you don't get an airlock. My my teacher when I was young always taught me how to play symbols, and that he used to talk about the marriage of the symbols of the two symbols. It's a marriage, ah. and so there's an attack, there's the mating. The symbols are together, kind of sizzling, and a release. And I would practice different lengths of attack, different lengths of sizzle, different lengths of release. And so I, it's kind of unusual that I'll play some crashes where I let those two plates sizzle for a second. And it sounds so zing, zing. I love that. When, I, when I'm yeah. teaching on the hot, when I say the hi-hats, you know, I say when the different, because there's, the opening of the hi-hat when you're playing a loose hi-hat and the way they sizzle and the length of the note can really affect the feel of the groove. And right. so I tell the kids, let them, let them French kiss. Right, right, you know? right, right, right. So, so I, yeah, I play with all those parameters and it changes depending on the, what's going on. Is the F of the lamb on the top? So is the grace note of the flam on the top symbol? There's no right way. Gotcha. A lot of people do that. I'm the bottom flam. I hit my bottom edges first and almost a scoop down. Ah. Like my left's going up, my right's coming down. Alan Abel used to talk about having two circles in opposite directions like that, you know. Oh, see, so, yeah, because I, I'm probably doing it wrong, but I... There is I, no rich. There's no wrong and no right. Okay, because I'm a strong right-handed player, so I would probably do the grace note on the top part of the symbol, and then there'd be an upward motion to where the right symbol is going up. I see. I like to use gravity a lot, so I'm... You're going down. There. I have some kinetic energy. I'm going down, and then I down and then i bring them up ah. yeah yeah i was always going up i don't know i wonder if alan shin should have pulled me aside and said hey well, kid well you know what i tell people there's no right and wrong way to do it you you look at the major league batting batters the guys that really hit a lot of home runs none of them are swinging the bat the same way none of them and but they're getting great results so you can get yeah. great results doing it a bunch of different ways yeah. it doesn't matter how how you achieve it as long as you achieve it wow I just got I just got a Piatti lesson today here, guys. Hey, are you ready? We're going to close out this session with the favorite five. Favorite color? Green. All right. First ever. I get a lot of black. I get a lot of blue. Okay, favorite green. drink? Favorite drink? Um, let's see. Uh, chocolate egg cream. Wow. That's very New York City, is it not? It's super New York. You won't see it outside of New York. If you don't know what it is, look it up. So you, do you get those at the little delis? The little delis that have a little bit. You can get them. You, we used to get them in like the soda fountains. Yeah. Or the delis, the delis. But I would make my own. So you, all you need is seltzer water, uh, some chocolate syrup and milk. It's chocolate milk with a little so seltzer water in it. I would have to make it with coconut milk or, or some sort oh, of non I, 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 milk. That, that's sacrilegious. You're lucky know. that you're lucky. Well, see, that's how California would make an egg cream. <laughs> <laughs> they would have alternative milk. They'd have hemp milk. They'd have oat milk. They'd have coconut milk. They'd have, you know. You know. <laughs> okay. Favorite food or favorite dish? 
Favorite food or favorite dish? Um, I'm simple. Hamburger, pizza. Uh, if, if, if I was on death row and I had one, one dish, give me a couple of hamburgers, some fries, and and some apple pie, and I'm good. You know what? I love that. That is so classically American, but I just feel like no matter what your you know, your health consciousness or your fitness or what everybody deserves a good old hamburger and French fries yeah. at least once a month. Yeah. I love grilling. We grill a lot. Yeah. You know, the weather's okay here. I, I we grill every night and I just taste so good. You're the grill master. I love grilling. So you're the more the cooker and the, the chef of the family. No, my, I'm not. A, I can't really cook anything. I could grill stuff. You're the griller, I'm a yeah. good griller, but I'm not a good chef. Hey, so this is a, this is could be next to impossible since you play drum set and classical percussion. But just something you hear on the radio anytime this sucker's on, you're cranking it up. Favorite song? Okay, that's this is an issue. Uh, is a particular genre or no? Nope, it could be just you know, like mine is like missing you, John Wade. I just think it's a really well written song. It's yeah. got a good feel to it. If I hear that on the radio. Right, right. I got to say, if I hear anything that the Beatles did, it's, it's cranking up. It's, I, I'm, I'm a Beatle fan from way back when. I'm one of those guys who saw Ringo on Ed Sullivan said, I, I got to play drums. Did you ever meet Ringo? I never did. Um, unfortunately, I would have loved Wow, no, this can still happen. He's in, you guys are both in great shape. Yeah, I mean, come on. You yeah, 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 yeah. Cross yeah. paths. How about yeah. your favorite movie? My favorite movie, Gone with the Wind. Really? Wow. That's classic. On with the wind. I've wow, seen. man. Yeah, yeah. That's it's a incredible. great score by Max Steiner. The, you know, the theme. And, you know, uh, it's just it's just the storyline of, you know, the old South. And and uh, it's a it's a it's a monumental movie. Hey, there's some parts of the South that are exactly like that to this day. Really? Well, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you got to come down here, buddy. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, you're like, don't take a left there. You don't right. like, you're not going right. to like what you're going to see. I'll, over I'll, there. I'll let you do the driving. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, This was so fun. I mean, you're just such a uh, you're like a I'm, people are drawn to you for a reason. You're a well, very you. affable, likable person. And I think that really had to has played into your success in life is people want to be around you. Yeah, well, thank you. And I, I really appreciate I'm honored that you would even think of including me. So thanks so much. I hey, when I'm thinking of a, a classical percussionist and a businessman, you are the first on the list. Well, thank you. I hope I get to see you in person sometime. Oh, uh, yeah, me too. And so uh, people want to keep in touch with you or ask you a question. Is there a way you like to be found on the net? Yes, yes. Um, the best email uh, for me is ngrover at grover pro one word dot com all right and grover grover pro dot com and grover at grover pro dot com i'm so sorry you're probably going to be flooded with questions about i'm happy i'm happy, <laughs> I'm, happy. I'm happy to connect with people new i people. love it hey so i hope the weather's warm enough for you to grill i don't know well it's 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 uh it's in the 40s it's 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 balmy here it's wow yeah, so I actually think we are going to grill tonight. So Very nice. Well, we we had snow apocalypse for a week. I was trapped in my place with icy roads for one week and me and my girlfriend ate everything in the pantry. I mean, everything. Wow. Okay. <laughs> we, there was nothing left. Uh, it just ended just in time. Neil, thank you so much, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. And to all the listeners, if you enjoyed this, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. And until next time, <laughs> we'll be here. We'll see you. Neil, thanks so much, bud. Thank you. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts. 